Great, great pleasure. Great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Fernando Hartwig, who many of you know from um, before. Uh, he's on a current visit up till February the 12th. He's available for bar mitzvahs, weddings, <laughs> and whatever. <laughs> um, uh, and he's going to talk to us about the Pilatus uh, cohort. Great. Cohort. All right. Take my mask off so people can understand me a little bit better. Thanks, George. Thanks, everyone, for joining remotely or here on site. Now we have already a much larger in proportion audience in relation to the last seminar. So that's quite a good thing, I suppose. Uh, so in, in, in this seminar, I, I, I just wanted to provide sort of an overview of the Pilotus Growth Cohorts. I don't want to go too deep into you know, specific specificities of some of the results I'm going to be showing today. But the, the idea is to present these cohorts, try to convince you that they can be useful, and also share some results uh, from these studies that show quite clearly that social determinants are very important in shaping health and development. So that's the uh, structure of the presentation. I'm going to start by uh, you know, discussing a little bit what birth cohorts are and why we care about them. Then I'm going to present the Pelotas birth cohorts and hopefully provide some context so you can you know, understand why we want to do birth cohorts in Pelotas. Then I'm going to sh just share some results looking at the association between early life poverty and some uh, measures of health and development in those cohorts. And then just some final comments at the end. So starting off with birth cohorts, um, this is an open seminar. So I didn't want to assume that everyone was super familiar with epidemiology. So I just wanted to spend a few seconds trying to summarize epidemiology in a single slide, which, which is a very you know, difficult task. Uh, starting off with a definition, we can understand epidemiology as the study of the distribution of health, disease, states, as well as their determinants in some population that we are studying. Perhaps this definition is not very useful if you're not uh, familiar with concepts such as distribution. So let's try to understand epidemiology by looking at some questions that epidemiologists can be interested in answering, such as, you know, what are the most common diseases in a given population? What are the main causes of death, again, in a given population? how health and disease indicators varies, say, between populations or over time in a single population. We can also ask questions such as, if there are any factors, that is, any characteristics of individuals or, or, or of populations that are correlated with higher probability of, of having a particular disease. Uh, and from correlation, we can also go one step further and think about causation. So. One question that epidemiologists are interested in and actually have already answered quite conclusively is that smoking is a cause of lung cancer. And those things can furnish uh, you know, po uh, policy making. And now we know that uh, then have, we have very good examples of this, for example, in Brazil, that policies aiming at reducing smoking lead to uh, reductions in uh, the rates of lung cancer in, in the population. So we, th those questions, they're really just illustrations of the many things we can be interested in when we do epidemiology, such as you know, description or surveillance tasks, identifying causes of diseases, designing and evaluating interventions, and many other things. Uh, if you want to do epidemiology, and if you want to do epidemiological research, we need to measure a group of individuals. When I say measure a group of individuals, I mean we need to collect data on a group of individuals. And those individuals should be selected uh, in such a way that they are representative of the population that we want to study. So if I want to study, say, the adult population in the urban area of Pelotas, then the group of individuals that I select for my study should be more or less representative of this broader group, which is my population. And I think this issue of representativeness, it's getting a little bit 
overlooked in some modern studies uh, in epidemiology. And uh, this is a quite, quite, quite a vague statement, like we need to collect data on a group of individuals. And there are many ways that we can do this, and those different ways correspond to different epidemiological studies. And one of such studies are what we call birth cohorts. And we can understand a birth cohort uh, as a epidemiological study that has two main characteristics. The first one is that the individuals are enrolled in the study right after birth, or you, you can actually do it before birth if you're recruiting pregnant women. And the second defining characteristic is that the same individuals are measured more than once, and indeed, typically several times over their life course. So here is just a schematic representation of what a birth cohort is. So we have you know, a group of individuals that we want to study, and we enroll them in the study right after birth, so at age zero, and that will be the baseline of the study. And then we measure the same individuals several times during their life course. Those uh, ages here are just examples. You don't have to do necessarily six months and then one year and then two years. This, these are just examples. And what is going to happen for sure is that the number of individuals that you have in your study is going to decrease over time due to factors such as you know, death, migration, and other things. Um, and so now that we know what a birth cohort is, we could the next question should be, why do we care? Why do we care about birth cohorts? And uh, this type of the epidemiological study is very useful to study long-term effects of early life factors. I mean, that makes sense, right? If you include individuals right after they were born, then you keep on measuring them over time. You have you know, the perfect setup for studying long-term associations. But then one could ask, why not you know, save time and just do a cross-sectional study that is just measuring individuals at one point in time and then say, ask them about what happened in the past. You would save a lot of time, a lot of money, right? Uh, you know, there are many limitations to this. Uh, one of them is, you know, measurement error. There are going to be recall issues. There's only going to be possible to measure things subjectively. I mean, in most of the things at least. And, and all these introduces error in our measures. And in, another point that's relevant to this presentation, is that we can only include survivors. That is, only individuals that survive up to that age, right? And if you're thinking about the role of social determinants, uh, you know, in health and disease, the survivors are likely to be, on average, you know, more privileged than the ones who did not survive. So that would be very bad if you want to study social determinants of health. You're going to be excluding, essentially, the, those that you want to include in your study. Uh, and you're also going to be prone to some types of bias that I'm not going to discuss uh, today. So birth cohorts are useful and they are not prone to this kind of limitations. But as you can imagine, they are complex, very time consuming and therefore expensive. And uh, this complexity and cost is particularly important in lower income settings like Pelotas, because we just have less money to do research, right? So those issues become prohibitively in some, in some situations. But we just discussed that those studies are very useful to study long-term uh, associations. So should we just like leave low-income settings behind in this aspect? Because you know the funding is often lower in those settings. Or should we try to do something about it? And what I'm going to be presenting now uh, it's one of the earlier examples of large, sort of large-scale population-based cohorts in lower and middle-income countries, which are the Pelotas birth cohorts. So, first, some geographic context, right? You can see here on the map Bristol, where we are, and Pelotas, where the cohorts are. So that's the trip I took to come. Uh, for, for this visit, I left Pelotas, traveled along the coast of Brazil to Sao Paulo, 
And then I, I took a flight from Sao Paulo to London and then a bus to, to Bristol. And here is a uh, zoom, here zooming in in Brazil. So we can see here uh, that Pelotas is right about where I'm pointing at the map. Like you can see my pointer, right? Can you see it? Can you? Yeah. Okay, good. So Pelotas is right about there. So at the extreme south of the country, very close to the border with Uruguay, but also at the coast because Brazil does, does this, right? So a little bit about uh, Pelotas. Pelotas is a medium-sized city in the extreme south of Brazil, as we just saw on the map. And it is, quote unquote, capital of the certain portion of the state. And to be more precise, Pelotas is the satellite city of the south intermediate region of my province. So it's not a formal capital, but it's kind of like the informal capital of that region. Uh, here I'm just showing my province here at, you know, in the upper figure and the entire UK in the same scale in the lower figure. So just to have some idea of, of dimension. Uh, and what I want to show with this table is a comparison between Pelotas, Brazil, and, and Bristol, just to provide some context uh, and for you to understand Pelotas a little bit better. So in terms of population size, Pelotas is, um, smaller than Bristol, but the total area is much, 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 much bigger. Pelotas is a very big city in terms of area. The rural area of Pelotas is massive, uh, but the population density is much lower, as we can see by comparing uh, Pelotas with, with Bristol. Uh, looking at some indicators now, the human development index of uh, the city, is 0 0.74 in 2010, was 0 0.74 in 2010, which is quite similar to Brazil in the same year, and much lower than Bristol, right? The Guinea index, which quantifies inequalities, is similar in Pelotas and in Brazil, and you know, worse than Bristol. The higher the, the number, the more inequality you have. So we can say that you have more inequalities in Pelotas than in Bristol, say. And to me, the most striking comparison is the last one, infant mortality. Again, Pelota is similar to Brazil overall, but look, compared to Bristol, it's way, 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 way bigger. So this suggests that in Pelotas, we still have a big proportion of the population that is very vulnerable in, compar in comparison to Bristol, at least. Okay. So this is just some context. So what we saw in the, in the previous uh, figure is that Pelotas is an, you know, big quote here, representative of uh, many cities in Brazil. Uh, and the, the thing about it is that is we have a lot of heterogeneity in, in the same city, so we can capture different realities depending on the subgroup of the population we look at. We have substantial social inequalities as evidenced by uh, the index and especially the high infant mortality rate. And this is bad. It's bad to have social inequalities. But in terms of research, it's actually useful because it allows you to study social determinants of health and development. So my desire would be that Pelotas would be terrible to study uh, social inequalities. But you know, terrible because everyone is good, not because everyone is bad. But because we have inequalities, then we better take advantage of it and, and use uh, the, the, the city as you know, a place where we can study those things. Uh, if you look, we'll go back to 1982, and this year is important because it's the year that we started the first birth cohort in Pelotas, registered data that we had was you know, overall very bad. So it wasn't reliable data. And this means that primary data collection was required for reliably measuring health indicators. And that's what, this was one of the big motivations for the Pelotas birth cohort, which actually started as a cross-sectional study. And then it became a cohort over time. Uh, and again, back in 1982, when the first cohort, the first birth cohort in Pelotas started, back then, most large birth cohorts were in high-income countries. Um, 
And this was bad in the sense that uh, this was leaving research questions that are relevant to lower income uh, countries, you know, unaddressed, right? So it was useful to start a cohort there that we could use to answer questions that are of relevance to uh, lower income countries. Okay, all nice, all beautiful, let's do a cohort there. Who is gonna do it? Who is gonna put in the work, right? And here it's time to pay tribute to two brilliant epidemiologists based in Pelotas, Professor Cesar Victor and Professor Fernando Barros. I had the honor of having uh, Cesar as my PhD supervisor, and we still uh, work together now as, as colleagues, although it's weird to me to uh, call Cesar a, a colleague. Uh, and here is a picture of our uh, research center in Pelotas. So yeah, you're very welcome to visit. I know some people from Bristol, from Bristol have, been, have been there already. And hope, hopefully they had a good time. So, uh, you know, if we have the cohorts now in Pelotas, we can thank those, those two guys, a lot, of, a, a lot more people obviously, but those two guys especially. So, what are the cohorts and who is enrolled in the cohorts, right? So, the way it works is that for every year of these four years, say 1982. So, in 1982, all individuals born in maternity hospitals in Pelotas, whose mothers lived in the urban area of the city, were enrolled in the study which means that from January 1st to December 31st, maternity hospitals were visited daily by a research team. Mm -hmm. And this happened in 1982, 1993, 2004, mm -hmm. and 2015. So we have four birth cohorts now. Each one started in one of those years. And you know, as in any birth cohorts, individuals were followed up on several occasions with especially high frequency uh, throughout childhood, because you know a lot of things have changed very fast during that period, so it's useful to measure uh, individuals very frequently during childhood. And here's just an overview of the cohorts. Uh, here is the year, and below, the number below is the sample size that we started, uh, uh, you know, at baseline. The number obviously goes down because uh, natality rates are going down, um, and. I'm just highlighting here in red the visits that we did in each one of those cohorts where we aimed at visiting, at, at measuring the entire cohort. And in yellow, just when we targeted subsamples of, of the cohort. So we see that in Pelotas 82, for example, we had several yellow marks, that is several follow-up visits targeting subsamples because we didn't have a lot of money. The same but you know, now a little bit less frequent for 1993 and for 2004 and 2015, we are only targeting the entire cohort because now you know, the group is famous and we can get money from, from funders and, and all that. So it's just an overview of the cohort, not, not, a, not a big deal here in the picture. I mean, it is a big deal to, to have that, right? But uh, not in the sense of what I'm going to present today. Good. So now I wanted to share with you some results uh, where we looked at the association between early life poverty and some health and development outcomes. And uh, I, I'm going to be presenting results focusing on the 1982 cohort. That's because it's the oldest cohort, so we can study long-term associations. Uh, the other ones are, you know, younger, so we have some, you know, time limit there. Uh, and I'm going to take this sort of life course perspective in the sense that I'm going to start looking at early life outcomes, then physical and cognitive development in childhood, then some measures of human capital, like, you know, IQ, schooling, that stuff, and also some measures of mental health. But for early life outcomes specifically, I'm also going to be showing some comparisons between cohorts to look at what's happening in Pelotas over time. So not the same individuals over time, but the same city over time, but different individuals. So all in the same age. 
So starting with early life outcomes, starting with the earlier stuff first, I suppose. So one of the things we can, we can look at in Pelotas, for example, is the proportion of mothers who attended at least six antenatal uh, visits during pregnancy. And this is just an indicator of like sort of proper antenatal care. Um, the red bars here correspond to the poorest subset of the population. And the blue bars correspond to the wealthiest subset of the population. And you know the bars in between, I guess you can you know guess what, what they mean, right? Just going from poorest to wealthiest, from left to right, for each one of the cohorts. So I mean the social gradient is clear, right? Here I don't even need to show any p-values here, right? It's clear that you know the proportion of mothers who attended at least six antenatal visits. Uh, is much lower among the poor than among the wealthy, right? But how, how did this change over time? Let's, let's try to look at it. So the gap size, and when I say gap size, what I mean is the difference between the blue bar and the red bar. That's the gap size, right? In 1982, this was 40% points, so a massive difference. In 2015, this was 26, rounding, rounding the number, right? 26% points. Still a big difference, but 26 is smaller than 40, right? If we look at, if we compare again though the wealthy group and the uh, poor, poor group, now not one minus the other, but in relative terms, we, we see that uh, this proportion was 90% more frequent among the, among the wealthy compared to the poorest subgroup. And when we go to 2015, it was just 36%. Still, uh, you know, it's, it's not a small number, but smaller than it was in 82, right? So, we can say that although we still see some uh, inequalities in 2015, it's not as bad as it used to be in 82, right? So there's still room for improvement, but you know, at the same time, some improvement has happened already, okay? So now the same thing, just changing the outcome. Instead of looking at antenatal care visits, we're looking at the prevalence of low birth weight, uh, which is you know, an indicator of uh, poor development uh, in the utero. Of course, it has limitations, but let's just stick with that. Uh, in 82, what do we see? A clear social gradient as well. So much more common in the poor compared to the richest subgroup of the population, right? And this, this is a bad outcome. So that's why the, the, the association is reversed in comparison to the previous one. If we go to 2015, we see a different pattern of inequality, what we call bottom inequality, where the poorest subset is worse than all others. And that's what we see there, right? We see in 2015, a higher prevalence of low birth weight in the poorest subset, and in the other ones, it's pretty much you know the same, sort of going up and down as we go uh, through, through all the other groups. Um, this is partially due to the fact that uh, C-section rates increased in the wealthy subgroup of the population, and this is associated with uh, low birth weight. But we, even though, even we, 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 with that, we still see this pattern of of, of bottom of bottom inequality, right? And again, the the both the uh, gap size in absolute and relative terms this decreased over time, which is you know good news. Infant mortality, so deaths per thousand life births. In eighty two, among the poorest, it was sixty. Two. 
So 62 out of a out of a thousand live births died during their first year of life. That's a massive number. That's a huge number, right? And in the wealthiest subset, it was 16.7, still big number. So, you know, a massive gap size, both in absolute and relative terms, and a clear social gradient. Here I have, I'm not dividing the population in three groups, I'm dividing it in, in, I'm not dividing in five, I'm dividing in three, because the numbers are, are, are much smaller. So to have better resolution, I'm just, did uh, three groups instead of five, but the, the interpretation is, is the same. When we go to 2015, what do we see? We, we went from 62 in the poorest to 12 in the poorest. So in 2015, the poorest are doing, are doing better than the wealthiest in 82. So a massive reduction in in uh, infant mortality rates over time. But we saw some slides earlier that in Bristol, overall, it's 2.9. And in Pelotas in 2015, only looking at the wealthiest subgroup is 6.7. So there's still a lot of room for improvement, right? So again, you know, clear social gradients, improvement over time, but a lot of room for improvement, for further improvement. So now we're done with comparing, uh, comparing cohorts. Now let's, let's uh, focus on the 82 cohort because it's the oldest cohort. So we can look at things from uh, infancy to adulthood. Uh, in this slide, I'm showing measures of physical and cognitive development in childhood. In terms of cognitive development, I have this intelligence test here applied uh, when the individuals were four years of age. And here, I'm just looking at the average value of this test among different groups of the population. So comparing the poorest, the sort of mid group and the wealthiest. And we can clearly see that the average value of this test varies, you know, increases as we increase the sort of socioeconomic position at birth. But what does that mean? Like going from 93.5 to, you know, 107.6. So what does that mean? Uh, one way to try to understand this is the following. Suppose we take the entire cohort. We don't, we don't divide, we take the entire cohort. And we looked at the values of this test in the entire cohort. If we take this value here, 93.5, about 27% of the cohort has lower values than 93.5. So this will be the sort of lower end of the entire span of, of the values of the test. When we go to 107.6, we see that 70, 71% of the cohort has values lower than that. So it's, in, it's in, a, in, a, in, in the other side of the coin. So we are going from 27 to 71. So it's a big difference. So it's, that's just a way of trying to make sense of, of this difference. The bottom line, if you are born wealthier, you have much better chances of uh, developing in terms of cognition as measured by this test compared to other uh, socioeconomic subgroups of the population. Now, if you look at physical development as measured by stunting at ages two and four, I mean, I don't think I need to say anything, right? Just a clear social gradient as well. Much, much, much higher prevalence among the poorest subset, the, the red bar, compared to the wealthiest subset, which is the blue bar. And if we look at the prevalence of stunting at two years of age in the um, poorest subset, it's almost 30% in 1982. So 1984, right? The Navies were born in 1982. They're two years of age. So this was back 1984. 
So back then, almost 30% prevalence of stunting at two years of age among the poorest subset of the population. So that's a huge number. Right? And if we divided the population further, we could probably find, find even higher prevalences. Um, so we saw that uh, poverty is associated with lower or impaired physical and cognitive development in childhood. Does that impact you as an adult? So let's try to understand that looking at this figure where I'm showing the association between socioeconomic position at birth as measured by family income. This is the poor subset. So I'm going from poorer to wealthier from left to right in the graph. And I'm showing three measures of human capital. IQ, which is the black line, uh, schooling, which is the red line, and monthly income as an adult. This is all, uh, th those are all measures in adulthood. And monthly income is the blue line. So, I mean, just looking at the figure, you see that, you know, there is a very strong positive association. The welfare you were when you were born, the higher you're going to uh, do, the better you're going to do in terms of IQ, schooling, and income when you are an adult. But like, how big are those differences, right? Well, I mean, if I change the scale of the graph, it can seem to be much bigger or much smaller, right? So uh, how can we understand how big those differences are? Let's try to do that comparing just the wealthiest subgroup to the poorest subgroup, right? Let's just focus in on those to try to understand how big those differences are. In terms of schooling, this difference is of six years. How big is six years? Well, high school takes three years, right? So I would say that six years is pretty big number. Monthly income. The um, difference between the wealthiest and the poorest was 800 Brazilian reais, which is the Brazilian currency. What does that mean? What, what, what does that even mean to you guys? The minimum wage in uh, 2012, which is when we took those measures, was 622. So the difference was substantially greater than one minimum wage. So th I mean, those are we are talking about big differences, right? And this socioeconomic position refers to when you were born. So notice how things that happen when you were born can have sort of long-lasting associations with you know, human capital, for example, which results in what some people call lower stocks. So you have you know, less training, you have lower IQ, so you, know, you just have lower stocks of human capital. Uh, but you know, the problem doesn't, doesn't uh, stop there. So here's the same figure that I've shown before. And the figure to your right is a very interesting figure. So the red line in the figure to the right corresponds to the poorest subset of the population. And the blue line corresponds to the wealthiest subset of the population. And what, what am I showing here in this picture? I'm showing the association between the IQ that you have at age 30 on the x-axis and your income at age 30 in the y-axis. So why do we see here? We see that if you were born wealthy, then having higher IQ helps you a lot in terms of income because the line is very much like this. However, if you were born poor, then having higher IQ doesn't help you that much, right? Because the, the line is much closer to horizontal compared to the, the red line is much closer to horizontal compared to the, to the blue line, right? So not only um, lower socioeconomic position at birth reduces your human capital stocks, you also make them matter less, right? So it's a double, sort of double burden on the poor from, from this perspective. But now, looking at uh, mental health, I said health and development, so I better you know, include a, a health uh, outcome here. Why not mental health measures, right? 
Uh, here again, those two were measured in uh, uh, age 30, so when individuals were 30 years of age. Here is just a score of sociological symptoms called SRQ for people who work with that, which ranges from zero to 20. And here we can clearly see again that, you know, the wealthier you are, the lower your score on this, on, on, on this test, which is what you want, because the, the higher the values, the sort of, you know, more and more sort of symptoms you have. And the uh, bar chart to your right, again, the red bar is the poorest subset of the population. The white bar is the wealthiest subset of the population. And we're going from uh, poorer to wealthier, from left to right. It's just the prevalence of depression at 30 years of age. And we can see, again, it's much bigger among those who are born poor compared to those who were born wealthy. And among those who were born poor, the prevalence is higher than 20%, which is, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot of people. So, well, that was pretty much the content of my presentation. I just wanted to say, you know, very quick final words before I hand over to questions. I hope to have convinced you that birth cohorts are useful to study the long-term effects, or perhaps I should say associations, of early life factors. Uh, and especially in, in lower income settings such as Pelotas, those studies allow studying the sort of long-term associations of social determinants of health and development. And uh, I, I do believe that the results I shared with you today uh, demonstrate the importance of social determinants you know, for, for in shaping health and development. I didn't show any p-value, any confidence interval, and I think everyone is convinced anyway. Uh, and I think this sort of body of results and many other results that I wouldn't have time to show here show that poverty is an old but still persistent major health problem that affects people's development, human capital, their health, and you know, all the many other dimensions of their lives. And for that reason, social epidemiology is very important and it's a key uh, field of epidemiology for detecting those inequalities and uh, furnish the development of equity-oriented interventions. We have many other results in uh, social epidemiology from the birth cohorts and people actually publish them in uh, books. So this, is, this, we could translate this as like, you know, um, inequality epidemiology or social epidemiology or something like that. Here is just a newer edition of, of the book. And on the last uh, picture there is the sort of second edition of the book, which is pretty much what uh, appeared in a special issue of the, of the IGE, I think, last year. Uh, and last year or the year before that, with the pandemic, we lose our uh, time reference a little bit. And the, the picture here is just showing Cesar holding, holding, the, holding the book. And I include the figure, the, the picture here, because I wanted to you know, take the moment to, to, to pay tribute to him, because you know, he's, a very, he's, a, he's just a genius guy and very kind person. And you know, to me, it was, a big, was an honor to have him as my PhD supervisor and to still uh, to continue to work with him uh, to this day. And thank you for joining in uh, on site and also people who joined remotely. And I'll be very happy to take questions. All right, people have questions? Deborah? I remember talking with Cesar and Alicia about this ages ago. Um, and I think at the time they were too busy setting up either the third or the fourth cohort. But has there been any attempt to link across generations of families on the sense that the first two cohorts could contain parents and even grandparents and the second two cohorts? And you could then look at sort of social effects across generations. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. Um, people were. As far as I'm aware, what people are trying to do uh, in this in this aspect is to I would say we are like one step uh, behind that in the sense that we are doing right now is uh, in the 
latest visit and, and now the next visits that we're planning, we are uh, asking participants about their, you know, if they have children, how old they are, when they were born, all of that. So we can then have the information to, to, to link between, between cohorts. So my expectation is that perhaps in a year or two, because all of the cohorts are, are we are doing visits for all cohorts now. Um, uh, it started last year and uh, it's probably going to end hopefully this year. So we, we should have the data to do that. Okay, really cool. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> and then... Yes, thank you, amazing talk. Um, it was really striking seeing the differences between the cohorts, you know, within, within the cohorts with regards to, you know, the health disparities between top and, and lowest kind of uh, quintile. And interesting across the cohorts, how things are potentially slightly improving in some of these outcomes. And I was just wondering if you can comment on, I can imagine it's the case, but how the Pilatus research itself has contributed to that. Um, has it had a lot of impact on kind of policy and things like that? Yeah, that's a great question. But it's also a very difficult question. Um, measuring the, 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 the impact of this kind of research is very difficult, right? Because you see things changing and it's essentially a decision on, you know, do I attribute this change to, to this or to this other factor, right? One thing that argues against it is the fact that many cities in Brazil have, have seen similar improvements, you know, in these or other uh, measures. Uh, it's, you know, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have an answer to that, to be completely honest. I, I, I do know some instances where uh, the research in Pilotus did sort of directly uh, influence uh, policymaking. One example of this is, you know, current breastfeeding guidelines, which are you know heavily influenced, of course, not only by Pelota studies, but you know, including studies from from Pelotas. Uh, another example are the uh, sort of current you know growth curves, which Pelotas was one of the sites involved in those studies, and those are used you know across the world. So th those examples are very um, you know are very easy to sort of understand and, and link one thing to the other. But for this, it's way more difficult because when you're talking about, you know, social determinants, changing them requires, you know, a, a, a very sort of structural change that's very broad and requires a lot of, you know, policy and so uh, polit politics. So it's different. It's difficult to link, you know, a research output to, to this kind of, you know, complex things. <laughs> I would hope that, that there was some impact, but, uh, but I don't know. Uh, I, I couldn't like conclusively say that that, 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 that there has been. So, so what you show with infant uh, mortality, that basically around 20 years, the, the, you know, the, 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 the uh, poorest group now have about the same rate as the richest group did 20 years ago. It's about the same. If you, uh, if you look at mortality in the UK over the last 40 years, basically the um, unskilled unskilled workers to professional top level professional difference in mortality rates is about 20 years essentially so so the low, so so the sort of the, the, the lowest uh, uh, income income sort of level group that's categorized has about the mortality rate of the highest from 20 years ago but when you put it that way sort of <laughs> it gives it a different feel to it because 20 years ago seems to be yesterday to me. And so if someone suddenly told me, God, you're gonna end up with the you know mortality, <laughs> mortality rates of 20 years ago, I think, you know, I mean it, it does put a different spin on it. And if you look at the differences, you, you know, um uh, an overall cause mortality against, you know, for example, funding on health inequalities, you know, there was absolutely no funding on health inequalities on there. Thatcher or the post Thatcher Tories, I mean, we couldn't talk about them. And then there was an outpouring of funding on health inequalities under the you know, mid period New Labour, which is when the improvements in life expectancy stopped, <laughs> stopped happening. But uh, so if you, if you tried to re re uh, relate them ecologically, it wasn't work very well. May not be what you end up. 
so I was going to ask you about the genetics of the table. So this has been quite heavily genotyped. And how have you thought at all about how we could use any of the genetic data that we've got, either in Bottas or elsewhere, to investigate some of these social, social phenomena? Um, because obviously, this is something that I think we've passed back in other British studies. Because there are additional challenges with Bottas given the time mixture. Um, ancestry. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing about it is that the lotus, for, for many things that genetics people want to do now, the sample size is small. Uh, you know, if George was saying 20 years ago, if 20 years ago we said that the sample size of, say, 5,000 is small, people would just be, you know, are you, are you insane? But now the, the question has been changed dramatically. And, now we suddenly, if you sample size lower than you know hundred thousand, and it, it is small. Uh, I, I, we haven't been using genetics data for this kind of thing. To be completely honest, um, I mean, for the for the things I've showed, I don't think you you need that to be, you know. Uh, because we are not trying to say anything about. Uh, you know, causation, or we're just showing, you know, sort of, you know, inequalities, really. And I mean, those differences, I would be pretty confident that they are, to a, perhaps not entirely, but to a big degree, in a causal. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure there are ways to, to exploit the genetic data that we have there for this, but it's not something that the group has been you know, doing, which you know, does not mean that we shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> Perhaps we should and we're just not doing it. And is there any scope to increase the size either by looking at family members or? Um... Yeah, there is. Uh, the, 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 the thing about it is that it can be quite tricky to expand to family members because they were not in the original cohort. So like ethics wise, it will be, I mean, it's doable, but it's a challenge, right? And for us, having these four cohorts running simultaneously, it's, all, it's already, I mean, it's already a lot of work, right? So um, um, I think we'll be more interested in genotyping the other cohorts because only the 82 cohort is genotyped yeah. than uh, trying to increase the sample size of one of the cohorts by including, say, family members and stuff like that. I was just wondering, in the trends that you showed between kind of Q1 and Q5 of portal wealthy, has the, if you look at actually, I don't know, what maybe you use income or whatever, is that shrinking over time as well? Yeah, that's a good, that's a, that's a good question. And it's a question I always want to think about when you're looking at inequalities, right? Because, you know, what, what can be happening is that the sort of income or whatever indicator you use differences, those are shrinking, right? And, and if you uh, do relative uh, comparisons, those are going to reduce just because of that. Um, is that concerned. an artifact? I mean, I'm not sure if, if that would be considered. And I'm, I'm not saying you were saying that's an artifact, right? I'm, 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 I'm thinking out loud here. You know, if that happened, if something happened, and that something lead to sort of bottom and top groups to have lower differences in an outcome that we're thinking, I think this could be interpreted as a, like, as a genuine reduction in, in, in inequality, because we're essentially, essentially saying that the sort of top and, and bottom groups are more similar in terms of, 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 your, of your outcome, right? Now, if you want to understand why that is, then I think this 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 comes into into play, right? And I just wondered if it's normal because I guess it's difficult when you use the quintiles to know is your quarter wealthy? Is that some kind of cumulative variable that means that it does end up roughly normal? So I'm just thinking, do you, you know, your bottom three quintiles actually is it if it's skewed then it, it changes slightly no yeah i see that's your point yeah i wouldn't say it's normal but i wouldn't say it's very it's highly asymmetric so you say most people are in the mid-range oh yeah yeah 
because this is not like a sort of income variable thing because um, we would definitely have this problem if it were income. Yeah. Uh, at least in Pelotas, I don't know how the income uh, variable works here in Bristol. But we have what, what we actually use is a is an uh, asset index. So we measure, you know, you know how many cars you have, where are, how many uh, fridges you have, how many bathrooms you have in your house, and yeah, you know, like and then you when you add those things, you just start to have something that's more like a continuous yeah. kind of roughly symmetric thing. Um, I want to know about the current sample size and how has it been with the loss to follow up? Yeah, I, I can answer you about the 82 cohort, which is the cohort I work the most on. Uh, it started, as I said, with 5,914. I have the number on top of my head. Uh, and the latest visit we had I'm going to round the number 3,600, right? So it's about 65% or 60% or something like that, which is quite good. I mean, com in comparison to other cohorts uh, that did this, you know, uh, a follow up for this long of a time, it's, it's, it's quite good. But, you know, the corrections are definitely in place in terms of like selection bias and stuff like that, if you want to be very strict and I think you, you, you do like you, you want to be strict. <laughs> Surprising number of homicides amongst the deaths. Also, isn't it? Uh, there is, yeah, the there is. We actually did, um, yeah. I'm not sure if this published, maybe I shouldn't say the result, but uh, some people were studying suicidal behavior in, in, in the 82 cohort and you're always going to get, a, to get an underestimate right. because you know people that actually did commit suicide, they're not going to show up in, 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 the, in the sample. The, the, the numbers were, were crazy. They were very high. I mean, for what you would expect for, for this kind of, of error. So, I mean, there is definitely a sort of big burden of like mental, you know, uh, the, the sort of mental disorders in, in, in the court and, and obesity as well. But don't look at click the online. You have to stop sharing the screen, I guess. Then you, then you can click the Q and I think it can just. Oh. There's Nick. How do you handle new measurement techniques when your real power comes from all the juvenile data? Yeah, I'm not sure if I understand the question 100%. Um, it's the kind of thing we've had thoughts about particular uh, mental health measures. Do you go for the newest, latest, greatest, best measure of mental health? Oh, I see. Or do you do the same measure you've used before so that you've got the same trajectory? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, I guess the uh, right thing for me to say in terms of the presentation being recorded is that we do both. But um, in reality, it's a mix. You know, it depends. If at some point we reach to a conclusion that, you know, the new measure is definitely better, the old measure wasn't capturing anything really or not what we wanted, then you just drop it because you shouldn't be using it like in the first place, like if, if, if you arrive at, the, at this conclusion. Um, if we think that the old measure is, you know, has merit and it's just slightly worse than the new, we are probably gonna keep using the previous uh, measurement uh, method that was available, and um, if possible, include the new one as well. Uh, I mean, it, and it also depends on like why do you want to, to measure it, right? If you want to sort of track over time, like the same thing over time, then you know, then you 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 you're more concerned about it. If you want to just like use say a single time point of this as your outcome, say, and an early life factor is your exposure, then you, you, you are more free in a way to, to, to pick, uh, to pick like the best measure for, you know, available at that, that particular visit. So it depends a little bit as well on why, why you want that. Uh, a sort of compromise that people have done in the past in the cohorts is to uh, 
say, use the new method in the entire sample and the old method in the subsample. So you can, you know, try to understand uh, how they correlate and, you know, try to come up with a strategy to allow you to do both things without, uh, you know, the proportional increase in the cost. Well, yeah, so the, the second the chat, maybe. Yeah, I'm just, I think he had another question. How, per, how persistent are these trends when looking across other studies or otherwise? Are the facts just scaled elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing is that there are not that many uh, birth cohorts in, in low and middle income countries. We do have this consortium called cohorts, which includes um, uh, birth cohorts in low and middle income countries from Brazil, so the Pilotas cohorts, the 82 and the now the 93 cohort, then cohorts from India, South Africa, um, Guatemala, and the Philippines. So we had five, now six, with the second Pilotas cohort joining in cohorts there. And when we uh, do comparison across those cohorts, um, I mean, we haven't done you know, that many comparisons, but we, have, we, we did do a lot of comparisons for human capital outcomes uh, in adulthood, and also for measures of physical and cognitive development in childhood. And for those, the differences are there in all cohorts. So not, not of those, the cohorts that we looked at in this consortium. So I would say that in middle-income countries, for, for the things that we uh, looked at, the, 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 the differences were, were, were there. Yeah, I think there is Carolina. Carolina. She couldn't have asked in, in part. <laughs> okay, can I ask a quick question then? Yeah. Uh, I was uh, just there she is. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, Fernando, because you mentioned about the challenges in funding the cohorts in the long term, uh, particularly mm -hmm. in settings where research funding is not necessarily abundant. Yeah. Uh, is is the Pelotas team considering to make wider use of uh, other sources of data, uh, like uh, record linked data such as Data Sus, Kajunico, and many others? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, we have to think about those things. Otherwise, there's a big risk we won't survive in the future. Uh, you know, the, the, the prospects at the moment are not the best. What we have been doing in, in Pelotas is attempts to do uh, web-based data collection. So uh, we actually just had a PhD student who you know, studied this in, in, in quite a lot of detail. He actually did a randomized trial of web-based data collection. So he had different forms of data collection, say longer questionnaires, shorter questionnaires, questionnaires in blocks, the whole thing together. Um, you know, different, uh, you know, how do you approach people by email, by, I don't know, WhatsApp or whatever, you know, he, he had like these many factors and he essentially randomized it to different cohort participants. So we have been studying this quite seriously uh, in Pelotas because this is one of the mechanisms that we can use uh, to, you know, have control over the data collection process, but at the same time, make it faster and less expensive. Uh, but we, uh, and, and I know Auspac, it's, it's like that as well. We don't, you know, blindly do those things. We want to make sure that the, the method we are doing for data collection, if it is web-based or not, you know, it's actually giving us what we want. So we are, uh, we are in a stage where we are understanding how to do this the best way. And those uh, randomized trials by this PhD student were very helpful. And for the current visits that are happening right now and will happen throughout the year, uh, part of the visit is going to be web-based. So things that you would ask by questioner anyway, you, you just ask them through the web and things that you need them in person, like measure their, their height or you know whatever, for those, they need to be in the clinic, but then the duration of the visit in the clinic is much shorter. So you do it much faster, lower cost and all that. So this is the strategy that we're going now, more like trying to find creative ways of primary data collection, rather than focusing on uh, sort of registered data, 
I'm not saying we shouldn't be looking at register data. Uh, what I'm saying is that I think the first step we're taking towards this direction is uh, web-based data collection. Brilliant. Anyway, we've, we've, uh, we've run over, but thanks for a fantastic talk. And Fernando is around till the 11th. And uh, so just let to have a meet with him while well, he's here. Yeah, here. Here. Well, <laughs> no, I'll just uh, email uh, him or uh, Julia and yeah, you can arrange it. Uh, to chat. Great. Thanks again. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.